super hard in Regal Room, right? Was it super hard in Regal Room? I think it's the... I was... I was dying. I think it's the... All right, guys. Let's be a second, please. Last time, we talked about political parties. We talked about how political parties are organized in the United States. They're organized similar to our governments, in which the Republicans and the Democrats have different branches. They have a national branch. They also have state branches, like there's the Texas Republicans and the Demo uh, Texas Democrats, and there's local branches as well. So today, we're going to talk about each one of these branches individually. We'll start from the lowest level, uh, the Hidalgo County level, so local organizations. It used to be that in the United States, and you might have learned this from Mr. Luna in your U.S. history class, um, it used to be that political parties ruled cities, big urban areas like Chicago and Los Angeles, using this system called political machines. What political machines do is they exchange jobs, they exchange housing, they give people jobs, they give people housing, and what do the people give them in return? Votes. And that's how they keep people loyal to their party. So if you're one of those people involved in a political machine, you vote for a party consistently because you rely on that political machine to give you the jobs and the housing that you need. Especially poor people in big urban areas are vulnerable to political machines and they stay loyal for decades serving the same party, voting for the same party because the party gives them what they want, which is jobs and housing. It's basically a old form of bribery in the United States. So political machines used to rule urban areas in the United States, and they use something called the patronage system. This will be on your multiple choice exams. So you go out and put a star on the patronage, uh, patronage system. Political machines use patronage. All right? Jobs and housing are given in exchange for political support, which would mean votes and loyalty to the party. So both sides, Republicans and Democrats, in the local level use political machines to take control of cities over and over again to have people vote for their particular party over and over again. But when the Depression hit, in the 1930s, political machines were eventually killed off. FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, ended that trend, that practice of exchanging votes for jobs and housing. So FDR killed party machines or political machines in the United States. We don't have these anymore. These are illegal back then, and they're really illegal now. All right. Moving on to the next level, we have state parties, like the Texas Republicans or the Texas Democrats. <clears throat> state parties are independent from each other, and they are independent and different from one another. The Texas Republicans are different from the New York Republicans. The California Democrats are different from the Iowa Democrats. Each one of the state parties operate independently from one another, and they usually have different rules, they have different structures than other state parties. Now, well, one of the important things about state parties in the United States is that they are in charge of the nominating elections in the United States, the primaries. You should know that one of the things, those of you that did your homework, one of the functions of political parties is they get to pick the nominee for each party. And what the state parties do is they're, they're the ones that get to organize those elections. They're not the real election in November. They're the election in which you're going to determine who's going to be the nominee for your specific party. So state parties organize nominating elections on what we call primaries in the United States. So before the real election, we have to select who's going to be the party nominee, who's the guy that the party's going to back up during the real election. And those elections, those preliminary elections, are organized by the state parties. State parties have different types of elections that they can choose from, but mainly they fall under two categories. The state parties can choose between a closed primary or an open primary. 
you need to know the difference between the two. They're going to be in your tests. This is one of the favorite questions asked on multiple choice exams on AP. Make sure that you remember the difference between the two. So if I was a state party, if I was a Texas Republicans, I can organize my nominating elections in two ways. I can have it closed or I can have it open. Make sure you remember the difference. In a closed primary, let's say Texas has a closed primary. There's a Republican primary and a Democratic primary. If the Republicans chose, choose to have a closed primary, what that means is only people who registered to the party can participate. If you haven't registered as a member of the Republican Party, then you're not allowed to participate in the Republican primary. You're kept out of the process. Who's kept out? Who can't vote in a Republican primary? Democrats. Democrats cannot vote. People who are not what? Who are not registered cannot vote. Who else cannot vote? What do we call people that don't have parties? Independents are not able to vote. Moderates are not able to vote in, in these um, primaries. Which is sad because usually elections are determined by who the independents go with. But in some states, this is what they choose. They choose to have a closed primary, only let the party members that are registered go vote. So, in the Republican primary, if you're not a registered Republican, you cannot vote. If you are independent, you cannot vote. Now, the open primaries are different. They're the opposite of a closed primary. An open primary is open to everybody. You do not have to be registered to your particular party to be able to participate in an open primary. So, let's say in Texas, the Democrats have an open primary. Who can participate? Everybody can participate. Independents can participate. Republicans can even participate. Democrats can participate. And you do not have to be what? You don't have to be registered to your party to be able to participate. That's the difference between a closed and an open primary. Closed primaries, only registered party members are allowed. Open primaries, everybody can participate in an open primary. Alright, I'm going to show you something that people do all the time in the United States. But I do not want you doing it. This is a danger. Sometimes you can be a little tricky when it comes to your open and closed primaries. Let's pretend Texas has a closed primary. And you are a hardcore Republican last year. And you want Donald Trump, and you think that he's going to win the Republican nomination, and you want him to win the presidency. But on the other side, with the other party, you have the Democrats, and the Democrats are currently choosing between two candidates for their nominee, Hillary Clinton, and who's the other one? Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. You heard in the news that according to the polls, if Bernie Sanders wins the Democratic nomination and goes up against Donald Trump in the real election, Bernie Sanders will wipe the floor of Donald Trump. He will beat Donald Trump decisively. But if Hillary Clinton was the one that won the, the nomination during the real election, Donald Trump has a chance against Hillary Clinton. You're a Texas Republican. It's both open primaries. What do you do? Where do you vote? Where do you vote? Where do you go? You go to the Democratic primary, and what do you do? You vote for Hillary. Why? Because she's beatable. Because if the Democrats choose Bernie Sanders, then Bernie Sanders will win the election in the real election in November. So instead, you choose Hillary Clinton because she knows your can you know your candidate can beat Hillary Clinton. And this happens a lot in, in states that have open primaries. They trick the system and people that are don't belong to a party vote in their primaries just so that they can select candidates who are beatable so that their candidate, the real candidate, can beat that guy in the real election. Sorry? That's what happens sometimes. Not all states have open primaries, so you can't do it in a state that have a, a closed primary. So closed primary, only registered party members are allowed to participate in an open primary. Everyone can participate, even independents can participate in an open primary. Try not to do this uh, sketchy practice. I mean, it's legal. 
and everything is fair game in a war, but all right. So we talked about the local parties, we're talking about the state parties, so we're going to go to the national party. The Democrats have a national party, the Republicans have a national party. Let's talk about them. There's a Republican national party and there's a Democrat national party, and they're all ruled and governed by their national committees. There's a Democratic national committee, what we call the DNC, and there's a Republican national committee, what we call the RNC. And they make the rules and the regulations for the national party. So they control and make rules for the national party. So we have the RNC and the DNC. These are a group of people, party leaders from all over the 50 states, and their job is to rule the national party, to control the national party. Their leader, a very important person, is the national chair, the national chairperson. There's a Democratic national chair and a Republican national chair. This is a big job. You're in charge of your national party, and when it comes to election time, you're going to be very busy trying to get your candidates elected into office. A national chairperson is in charge of the day-to-day -day activities of a party. When it comes to election time, they won't be able to sleep because they're trying to get their party members elected into office. This, I think she's currently the Democratic National Chairperson. They might have changed her, I'm not sure. Alright, one of the most important things that the National Party does is every four years, they do a big pep rally for the party. Around the summer, of what year? During every four years. So which years? Election. During elections for what? President. During president during presidential election years before November in June or July, both parties have their big pep rallies. They're called national conventions. And these national conventions, celebrity guests come up, and it's all about energizing the party behind the nominee that they chose for president. So the National Convention looks like this. This is the Republican National Convention in 2012. Again, it's all about energizing the party. It's all about getting the party excited about the presidential candidate that they chose. In this particular case, in 2012, the Republicans chose Mitt Romney. He's going to lose eventually to Obama. But he was the nominee that was chosen by the Republicans in 2012. Why do they need a national convention? Because the months before the national convention, they were doing the primaries, and the party was tearing each other apart. Party members trying to be president, trying to become the, the nominee for the party, have been talking bad about each other. Their supporters are going up against each other. So this is the time to heal the party. This is the time to unite the party again. Because the months leading up to this, the party is tearing each other apart because the, the people that are candidates are trying to get the nomination for the party. So it's all about energizing the party behind the candidate that they chose. And usually the most important thing that happens during a convention is they announce who won the nomination for the party. In this particular case, Mitt Romney won the Republican nomination for the Republican Party for president. So the party nominees for president and vice president get announced. Not only that, in the national convention, the party platform gets developed. We talked about the party platform yesterday, the goals and the values of the party. This is when they develop, they tweak it. They don't usually change it a lot from four years to four years, but they tweak it every four years. But it's basically a pep rally for the party. Celebrity guests would come in, people singers would come in, orgasm of balloons. <laughs> All right. Party and government are party members that were elected to office. 
This is the last head of a political party. These are the people that were elected into government offices. All right, I know you have a preconception of government and politicians, but according to statistics, promises made by candidates, contrary to popular opinion, are usually met, are usually kept. So usually, the candidates and the promises that they give us when they were trying to get our votes, when they do get to office, when they do get elected, they do try to keep their promises. So that might be good news or bad news for you if you didn't vote for Trump or voted for Trump or supported or not support him. But usually they do try to keep their promises. That is why it's very important whichever party we give control of government to. Because if we give control to the Republicans, for example, like we did last election, we can expect what kind of policies to get cracked out. Conservative or liberal? Conservative. Because they, they promise conservative policies. If they, we give control to the Democrats, then we can expect liberal policies. So whichever party is in control is important because they do try to keep their promises. All right. Draw a line, unit eight, lesson two. We're gonna go really quickly because we didn't finish the last time in the last period. Unit eight, lesson two. Just go ahead and write it down, please. Unit eight, lesson two. Why don't you look at the map on the board? This is an electoral map during the presidential election of 1860. Yesterday, uh, we talked about how red represents which party? Republicans or Democrats? Hello. Republicans. Blue represents the Democrats. So I want you to look at this map. These were not states yet in 1860, so they don't have a voice in presidential elections. <coughs> well, can you notice, most of the Republican support comes from where? The North and the West. And most of the Democratic support comes from where? The South. Let's fast forward 100 years later. We get the election of 2008. This is the first time Obama became President of the United States. What do you notice? Switched. Now, who controls the South? Republicans. The Republicans control. Look how deep red the South is. And what happened to the North and the West? They turned blue, they turned Democrat. Somewhere along those 400 years, somehow the support for each party flipped. Somehow the South became um, Republican, and somehow the North became Democrat. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Before that, a couple of vocab words. Very important, this is going to be your test. Coalitions for sure. A lot of people miss that on the test. Make sure you know what coalitions are. Coalitions are social bases that, in, that, that parties rely on for support. And by support, we usually mean votes. Every single election, the Democrats and the Republicans rely on certain groups to vote for them so that they can get elected into office. These are what we call coalitions. So here's a question. We have two major parties in the United States, Democrats and Republicans. Give me a coalition today that supports the Democratic Party, a social base, a group that usually vote Democrat, and the Democrats rely on every single election to vote for them. Which group in the United States would usually vote Democrat? Talking about race. We could be talking about race. Uh, the LGBT community is a coalition that supports a Democratic Party. What else? Minorities. Minorities like African Americans and Hispanics are usually on this side. Who else? Women. Women would usually be on this side. Give me one for the Republicans. Whites. Whites would usually be in the Republican side. The NRA, people who are against gun control, the wealthy, the religious would be on the Republican side. Does everybody get what coalitions are? Mm -hmm. They're groups of people that these parties rely on every single election for support. Examples, you can put African Americans, you can put um, religious, supports the Republican Party a lot. 
All right, another vocab word, coalition building. Sometimes these coalitions get together for a common cause, like getting somebody elected, or getting a policy through, or getting a policy killed. Coalition building is getting coalitions together for a common cause. Getting groups together for the same purpose. In 2008, what President Obama did very well was to build up coalitions of minorities, of liberals, of people that hated the Bush administration, people that hated the two wars that we had during the Bush administration. And that coalition enabled him to get elected by a landslide. So that's coalition building, getting groups together. All right. But here's the main topic today. These coalitions are not always as loyal as you think. There are times that these coalitions flip sides and they start shifting allegiances. I'll tell you right now, 100 years ago, African Americans who are now deeply loyal to the Democratic Party used to vote Republicans. They used to be on this side. But somewhere along the line, African Americans switch sides, they switch their loyalty and allegiances to the Democrats, and that's what we're going to learn today. Those shifting of allegiances. And that's what we call party realignment. When you realign something, you change something. This is when coalitions shift allegiances or loyalties. When a coalition changes from one party to another party, in supporting or voting for one party and then start supporting somebody else. The balance of power is change during party realignment. Parties either get stronger because more coalitions are joining to them or flipping sides or they get weaker because coalitions are leaving them. When the Republicans, when the African Americans left the Republican Party, the Republicans got weaker. All right, next, critical elections and realigning elections are pretty much the same thing. Party realignment are punctuated by moments of elections in which the coalitions decide to vote for somebody else. All right, so new issues are brought to public attention. Coalitions vote for another party during critical elections and realigning elections. Oftentimes, the party in control loses control to another party. Because they lose these coalitions, they move out of the party that was in control, and they go to somewhere else. They go to another party. So party realignment and critical elections and realigning elections pretty much the same thing. When coalitions switch sides, when they vote for somebody else, that's what we call realignment. But realignment in the United States is very rare. It often happens when something traumatic happens in the United States. Something catastrophic happens. Like a what? War. Like a war. Like a depression. So during times of crises, during times of catastrophes, when new issues are brought up to public attention, sometimes coalitions forget their allegiances and they move on to another party. And the party that they control might lose that control. Now, in very rare occasions, when enough coalitions move to another side, when enough coalitions are gained by a party, that party becomes invincible for a time, for a period of time. And if it's long enough, we call that a party era. So sometimes we get a bunch of coalitions joining or supporting one particular party, and they become invincible during elections because there's just too many votes. And if they maintain control for a very long time, maybe a period of 10 years or 20 years, we call that a party era. A party era is a long period of time dominated by one party, always winning elections. In modern American history, this, isn't, this, isn't, this doesn't happen very often anymore, 
But back 100 years ago, this happened a lot in the United States when we have one party dominating the United States, winning election after election, controlling the government for a very long period of time. All right, another thing on your test. For sure this is on your test. The Constitution does not say anything about political parties. The Constitution does not mention political parties in the United States. In, in the Constitution, in, in our founding document. The Constitution does not mention political parties or, at all. Our founding fathers did not anticipate us relying so much on political parties in the United States. In fact, our first president, George Washington, before he left office, after eight years of a very successful presidency, he gave us a letter called the Farewell Address. In Washington's farewell address, he warns us about two things. Number one, don't make alliances with other countries because that might lead us into war. But then the second warning is, don't make political parties because it would just divide the United States. Like in other countries where they have political parties, their countries are deeply divided and people are fighting in the streets. We don't need that in the United States. So George Washington said, don't be aware of partisan fighting. Be aware of political parties because they will just divide the country. After he leaves, his, first, his two closest advisors creates the first two political parties in the United States. The Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, founds the Federalist Party of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson, the Secretary of State for George Washington, founded the Democratic Republicans. So we have the two first political parties in the United States. Go ahead and write those down for me, please. Think of the Democratic Republicans as the ancestor of the modern-day Democratic Party. This is where the Democrats came from. The Republicans we're not going to see until later on. This is where the Democrats came from. The Democratic Republicans had strong support in the South. The farmers supported them. The Southerners supported them. Slave owners supported the Democratic Republicans. And for the Federalists, they had a lot of support in the North. Traders, bankers supported the Federalist Party. What's weird about what you see on the board? So the Democratic Republicans, the ancestor of the Democratic Party, when they first were founded, were what? Conservative. They were conservative. They were the party for small government. Today, the Democrats are what? Liberals are the party for big government, but when they started out as Democratic Republicans, they were the conservative party of the United States, countered by the Federalists, who were the liberal party of the United States, the party of big government. But when the Democrats first started out, they advocated for small government. They were conservatives when they first started out. So, they battled each other in early United States history until 1812. Anybody know what happened in 1812? We got what? We got a war. We have the War of 1812. Who did we fight in 1812? You guys weren't over there. You guys were sleeping. In 1812, we fought the British for the second time. The first time was we were trying to get our independence. The second time was in 1812. We were greedy and we tried to get Canada from them. We lose, by the way. But we don't lose the war, but we lost in Canada. Um, in 1812, the country was divided. The Federalists didn't want that war because the Federalists traded a lot with Great Britain. They liked Britain. But the Democratic Republicans wanted to get those British lands away, and they supported the war. The Federalists, when it looked like we were losing in the beginning of that war, because the, the British were kicking our asses all over the place in Canada, in the third, we, they burned the White House in the War of 1812. It looked like we were losing. So the Federalists decided, you know what? If we do lose this war, we're going to secede. We're going to take the North, the New England states, and we're going to secede from the United States. Long before the South ever thought about seceding from the United States, the North was planning it already. And they're going to say, you know what? The British are going to forgive us, and we're going to be our own country, New England. We didn't lose the war. At the very most, it was a tie. But when the war was over, people found out what the Federalists were doing, what they were planning to do. While people were dying on the battlefield, the Federalists were planning to betray the country to the British. So they lost support. If you called yourself a Federalist, nobody would vote for you. So the Federalist Party, because of the War of 1812, became extinct. They went away. 
and for the, for a while we have one party in the United States, and that's who? Democratic the Democratic Republicans. What do we call that? Party year. That's a party year. For the longest time, our government is controlled by the Democratic Republicans for about 20 years. They dominated the United States, and the Federalists died off. And then we get to the election of 1824. Election of 1824. In 1824, there were four people who were contenders for the presidency. One of them is one of the heroes of the War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans. His name is Andrew Jackson. He's the guy in that picture over there. Where am I going over here? His name is Andrew Jackson, one of the heroes of the War of 1812. Another guy, a president's son in John Quincy Adams. John Adams is his son. The third guy, I don't know his name, we're going to call him Bob. <laughs> the fourth guy, his name is Henry Clay. Most of you that, those of you that are just from, from Mr. Luna probably know who he is. He's the great compromiser. What's so funny about this? All of them, all four of those guys belong to what? To the Democrat Republicans. All of them were from the same party. They were all fighting each other for the presidency. How do you become president of the United States? What kind of votes? You need electoral votes. How, much, how many electoral votes do you need to be president? <laughs> you don't need the most. You need the majority. How much is the majority? More than 50%. You need the more than 50% of the electoral votes. Today, that would be 270 electoral votes. If you get that, you're the president of the United States. So you need the majority. You need more than 50% of the electoral votes. What happened here, and this is not the first time it happened, is none of the candidates got more than 50%. Andrew Jackson got the most popular votes. He also got the most electoral votes, but he didn't get enough. He didn't get more than 50%. According to the Constitution, if no candidate, if none of the candidates get more than 50%, we take the top three vote getters and we let the House of Representatives decide who's going to be the president among the three. Who should be president? Jackson should be president because he won the most votes. He also won the most electoral votes. So if you are a self-respecting person in the House of Representatives, you should probably cast your vote on Andrew Jackson because he is ultimately who the people chose. But that's not what happened in 1824. Henry Clay, who had no chance of winning because he's not part of the top three, so happens to be the Speaker of the House. He is the leader of the House of Representatives. And he still wanted to be president, but not yet. He knows he doesn't have a chance. So he goes talking to John Quincy Adams, and he tells Adams, I'm going to make you president. I'm going to use the influence that I have in the House of Representatives, and I'm going to make my buddies elect you, and you will become the president of the United States. In return, once you become president, you're going to make me your secretary of state. Why secretary of state? Because back then, all the secretary of state that we've had have become presidents later on. Thomas Jefferson was George, uh, George Washington's secretary of state. James Madison, um, James Monroe.